Then the Marquis Duplex at Pondicherry allied himself with a certain Hindu leader named Chanda Sahib. And a joint army of Frenchmen and Indians virtually conquered the whole of the East Coast in the middle of which was the English East India Company's Madras and British Fort St. David, where young Clive was still stationed. And then, to add to the English Company's unease, Duplex manoeuvred himself into controlling the whole vast central plateau of India, the Deccan. The English Company's predicament was critical. What were the British going to do about it? They weren't, at that time, particularly interested in Indian territory. They were only interested in Indian wealth. But now, they would have to move territorially, or Duplex might easily push the British into the Indian Ocean. Well, when Duplex and Chanda Sahib had overrun the eastern coast and had killed the ruler of that area, one of that dead ruler's sons named Muhammad Ali, yes, I'm afraid so. Anyway, he, Muhammad Ali, escaped to Trichinopoly, down here in the far south of India where Ali ruled around this impressive citadel and now Hindu temple. And the British began to counter the French alliance with Chanda Sahib by sending a very small force to support Muhammad Ali in Trichinopoly. By July 1751, News reached the British in Trichinopoly that Duplex's French soldiers, together with Chanda Sahib's army, were moving further southward to conquer Muhammad Ali. Robert Clive, besieged in Trichinopoly, considered the British predicament and he devised a daring plan. Clive volunteered to slide through the French and Chanda Sahib's besieging force, return northward to Fort St. David, and there raise another small expeditionary force which would then attack Chanda Sahib's capital city of Arcot, behind Chanda's back, as it were. The whole enterprise was a hair-raising gamble. What was virtually at stake was the survival of British trade from one end of eastern India to the other. Robert Clive was now 26 years old. Clive hurried his men through the appalling heat and then the monsoon broke with crushing violence. The soldiers garrisoning Chanda Sahib's capital of Arcot knew that Clive and his soldiers could move no further. But Clive, with his three field guns, did not even slacken his pace. Through the blinding tropical storms they came and arrived at Arcot, the city was deserted. Chanda Sahib's soldiers believing that the spirit world had made Clive's incredible advance possible, lost their nerves and fled. Not a shot was fired. Clive reordered the defenses of this citadel of Arcot. But he only had his 500 men and Chanda Sahib's power was quickly regrouping. Soon, there would be 10,000 warriors surrounding Clive and his small force. And among the new arrivals were 200 French Marines. And these Frenchmen had 
heavy artillery with them. Clive doggedly defended the citadel. It is barely credible to learn that, as he inspected his men here on these ramparts of Arcot, on three separate occasions, the sergeant accompanying him was shot dead by besieging snipers. Finally, Chanda Sahib's army and Duplex's Frenchmen decided to finish off Clive and his humiliating presence on November the 14th, 1751, which was the last day of the Muslim festival of Muharram. The Muslims believed that any one of them who died while trying to kill an unbeliever on such a day would go directly to paradise without any messing about. On came Chanda Sahib's hordes. Massive attacks were made on Arcot and the British with their Indian allies blazed and blazed back. There were hundreds of scaling ladders thrown against the walls of Arcot. Armor-plated elephants charged the gate and any of the vulnerable places. Clive inspired his men to ferociously fight back. Chanda Sahib's army and the French gave up and retreated. They made efforts to carry away their dead and wounded, but the British and their Indian allies continued to kill them without mercy. A friend of Clive's, Robert Orme, stated, We British were left to gaze at each other in the first garish brilliance of the suddenly uplifted sun. There were now only 80 British Europeans on their feet. But, uh, like all good Britannia stories, and this one happens to be true, a British relieving force marched into Arcot on the following day. Uh, one of Clive's defenders put it this way. We solaced ourselves with the pleasing reflection that we had maintained the character of Britain in a climate so remote from our own. The legend that Clive was invincible began to spread across India. Clive achieved this valuable reputation by exposing himself to enemy gunfire to inspire his inexperienced soldiers, by his instinctive military genius, and also by employing the traditional Indian military method of bribing enemy commanders. <laughs> <laughs> 